My name is Nina. Hold on, I'll just I'll put up the slide because I have it. Okay, Nina. My PhD training is in gene therapy research um, from UNC Chapel Hill. And um, after graduate school, I taught for I taught for a couple of years at Carnegie Mellon University. So it was just lab classes, molecular biology courses, cell and developmental biology classes. It was a ton of fun. Um, but I was doing that full time, and I still had the research bug. So I decided to um, start my postdoc here at Berkeley in synthetic biology. And I can tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, later if you're interested, but um, whatever you've heard about synthetic biology, I'd probably do something related to that. <laughs> um, I'm pretty much messing around with DNA all day and doing a lot of cloning, and mostly cloning. Sometimes an experiment gets thrown in there <laughs> as well, and uh, I'm just, you know, giving bacteria new functions, and initially it was a project to engineer biosensors. Now I'm on a project um, doing some metabolic engineering to make uh, some small molecules, and I'm also trying to study the stress response in E. coli. So I'm yeah. co-expressing various proteins from different protein families, and trying to see like what protein families cannot coexist, um, in order to help build prediction models um, for someone that is doing engineering. And if they, you knew ahead of time, like I can't put a transferase with an oxygenase or something that's going to stress out the cell and the cell's going to die or it's not going to grow as well. Like, if you knew that information ahead of time, would it help you better, better engineer your system? So those are, those are the types of projects that I'm working on. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just went, as I said, I'm going to talk to you today about, you know, how you would move a gene from one organism to another, what are the tools that are available, and this should empower you to explore those tools and, you know, come up with some of your own ideas that you can talk about in the future. So let's say you came across a really interesting gene. And um, it, I don't know, maybe it has some interest, it has some function. Maybe it participates in uh, a metabolic pathway that creates your favorite small molecule. So someone shoots something out. What are, your, what are some of your favorite small molecules? Anything. Or not so small molecules. Amyl acetate. Amyl acetate. And what can you use amyl acetate for? Banana flavor. Banana flavor. Okay, so maybe you came across, maybe you know the gene in bananas that you know, is in the chain of reactions that produces amyl acetate, acetate. So, you know, okay, maybe that's the project you want to pursue. And I believe that project has already, is available. So if someone wants to try to recreate that, that would be an awesome thing to go after. Um, so let's think about the thing. So first example, you want to make a chemical factory of some sort. You want to make a new fragrance. Um, you want to make a fuel. You want to make something that goes into a face cream that helps you with wrinkles. You know, there are many, many things that you could think of that maybe you'd want to make. Um, maybe you want to move a reporter gene. So who knows what reporter genes are? What's a reporter gene? Um, I'm not. You put it in after or before the gene of interest, so, and it creates a protein product that you can analyze for the presence of. Yeah. So like GFP. Exactly, like GFP. So what Ben was saying is like, let's say I made a, a library of promoters. Who knows what a promoter is? Who doesn't? I don't know. You should ask them. Who doesn't know what a promoter is? <laughs> What, what's a promoter? A uh, promoter is a sequence that regulates the expression of a gene. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you have a sequence that regulates gene expression, and some are high expression, some are low expression. So, you could imagine, like, maybe you have a whole series of promoters and you want to characterize them. How would you characterize expression off of a promoter? How would you characterize expression off of a promoter? Ben. Um. So you have the, the second gene that does, say, GFP, yeah. that gets um, created, and you're, you're assuming along with your gene of interest. Okay, so let's say you had a library of promoters. You could, after that promoter, drop GFP in, right? And if you, if you transform that, if you put that DNA into cells, you would have cells that fluoresce, what everyone knows, what, well, maybe not everyone knows this, GFP is what? Green fluorescent protein. Um, 
So you would have cells that would fluoresce to different intensities, potentially? Yeah, okay, so maybe, you're, maybe you want to move a gene over like GFP because you want to characterize some sort of expression library. That might be a study. So that's something that you know, someone could make in this community. You can make a promoter library and have you know, your own set of promoters that have different levels of expression. That could be a fun small project. How big is a promoter? How big is a promoter? <laughs> it depends, if, if actually. Do that. Um, yeast promoters are large, much larger than um, E. coli promoters. So E. coli promoters, so there's a known stretch of sequence um, that is like the minus 35 and minus 10 upstream of a start site. And um, the promoter library is not that large. Like the PTEP promoter, I think, is probably like 20-ish nucleotides or so. Don't quote me on that. I can pull up the DNA sequence for you. But we're talking about like short stretches of yeah. DNA. Very, and how, you know, and how much would it cost to synthesize that? Like. Yeah. So typically, right now, depends. It depends what you do. If you want to, if you want to make your own promoter library, you can actually like start with a. You could start with a base promoter. So if you had a vector, and this was your promoter region right here, you could actually go to a place like IDT, if everyone's sort of integrated DNA technologies, and you could order primers that have like random nucleotides um, in them. So this is a step towards <laughs> some detailed molecular biology. But if you had a primer that, um, if this is your promoter region, and you had a primer that bound this way and had randomized nucleotides coming off of the end, um, and bound to your vector, you could amplify the entire vector and put random sequences where the promoter region is. Um, and that we could go into detail later. Or what you can do is you can order oligos that are have randomized regions in them, and you can anneal them and actually like drop them into this region using restriction enzyme digest. <coughs> there are various ways in order to make this happen. Um, if you want to get, we'll talk about DNA synthesis in a little bit, but if you want to like synthesize an entire gene, right now the going rate is about 20 cents per base pair. So it's still <coughs> fairly expensive. Um, but, it, but for these short promoter regions, for these short it's promoter not region, expensive. it's not. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Is so. That, is that price coming down a lot these days, or mm -hmm. is it kind of stable? It's still coming down. It's dropping. Mm -hmm. I don't. It's still going to be pricey, you know, for a few. For, for the next two years. Yeah. For a couple <laughs> years. Yeah. Is there a gold price that the industry wants? Well, some people would say free, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's a goal price, actually. I think it's just how low can you can they make it. I, I don't think it's there's a goal. Um, so it's not like uh, personal genomes, the goal is like the $1,000 genome. Then, okay. Yeah, I think that was more like a flashy sell like, yeah. than, mm -hmm. than anything yeah. else. Um, OK, so maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to engineer your organism. I'm going to talk about bacteria. Maybe your favorite organ, organism is yeast to like sense another molecule. So what do you think that would mean? Like if you if someone said to you like I want to make E. coli sense estrogen or something along those lines like in in waste in water like what what does that mean to you like what do you, what might be happening inside of the cell there? It's making a protein or something that binds estrogen and afterwards there's some sort of reaction that you can measure. Yeah. Sure, absolutely, right. It could be like a downstream fluorescence readout or, you know, a phenotype change of some sort or something along those lines. Okay, so maybe you want to make a sensor. Um, maybe you want to study, so the big thing in synthetic biology right now is like this big data movement where we're actually taking a step back and trying to understand <coughs> how cells function, um, period, <laughs> because we're learning that when we're building these devices, um, <coughs> cell metabolism and cell growth is being altered significantly and sometimes the devices that are built don't function and there was this initial movement like hey we can build any anything but in reality in reality we can't build anything and everything now we have to take a step back and understand like why what why is it what we is that what we built why is it not functioning like we thought it should so a lot of people are trying to understand cell environment cell growth under certain gene expression conditions like these larger studies so that's something of interest okay but I think we could probably really focus on, um, I think the first three areas, like making some sort of small molecule factory is something of interest in the DIY community. Maybe making sensors of some sort to detect some small molecule. We can explore those avenues. Um, 
I think it would be great if there was a repo your own repository of DNA and we were able to characterize promoters and RVSs, which are ribosome binding sites, which are necessary for gene expression in E. coli as well. So there are all these sorts of different areas to explore. So I'm going to just throw out three random ideas, and then the goal of this is we're taking one of those ideas, and we're going to just like see it through to the end and like the thought process through that, you know. Okay. So first, I'm going to put this slide. Does anybody know what this animal is? It almost looks like the that extinct. That's no, it's not extinct. <laughs> How big is it? Oh, is it newly discovered? No, I don't think so. Small, like rodent small. But I, I mean, like, I don't expect you guys to know what it is. Um, <laughs> How big is it? An agouti. I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> Um, what is that, Patrick? <laughs> I'm blanking on what it is. Okay. Well, it's a civet. Mm -hmm. A civet. Right. Oh. oh, you all know what a civet is. I don't know what a civet is. I know what a civet is. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about a civet if you happen to know any you know some information on a civet? Yeah, the civet is a it's a small mammal that um, I'm familiar with in Asia actually. Okay. As a carrier of some diseases. Hmm. SARS in particular. Ooh. Are, are these the ones Sorry. that make good coffee? These yeah. are the ones that make good these, <laughs> these civets make excellent coffee. That's my next slide. Patrick, you just ruined it. That's my next slide. <laughs> my next slide is then what is what do you think this is? Poop. <laughs> it is. Coffee digestion. Coffee bean poop. Yeah. See some people when they first saw this, they think like it look, kind of looks like cord like a Granola bar, doesn't it? <laughs> no, seriously. Bigger, it could be like a nut. Displays, it looks. It could be like a nut, chocolate, peanut. Yeah. Okay, no. Okay, you are correct. It is civet duty. Okay, so we have civet duty now. As I'm sorry, your name is escaping me at the moment. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, as you mentioned previously, um, that is something to consider. The diseases, the disease aspects, that brings a whole new twist to this, but I, I wasn't going to go there. But civet duty, civets plus passing coffee beans through the digestive system of civets equals the most expensive coffee in the world. Um, so, and this is true, you can buy yourself some. Um, I don't know how much, how many ounces are in these little freezer, these little packs here, but you can get yourself some expensive civet duty coffee. Can, can we like buy a DIY kit with a live civet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I was gonna think, I was trying to think outside of using the civet. Because I don't know, having knowing my coffee has been passed through the digestive tract of an animal is not very appealing to me, but apparently um, civets, they make the most expensive coffee in the world, so why can't we make it without the shit? Okay, no? All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for laughing. Okay, so apparently the, there are digestive enzy enzymes in the civet's digestive tract. Um, they're proteolytic enzymes that break down proteins in the coffee beans. And the beans, I don't know much about them, um, but I think that it would be an interesting project <coughs> to try to figure out like what enzyme is responsible for um, processing the beans. And if you could imagine if we could like grow that protein up in a bioreactor and isolate the protein ourselves, we could make the most expensive coffee in the world. But it wouldn't be most expensive coffee in the world anymore. It would be a less expensive version that did not go through the digestive tract of an animal. So I tried looking into the, um, the enzymes responsible for this process and I was having a very difficult time. I do not think it is known, but it's definitely something that is interesting to consider. Maybe with a little digging could be a cool exploratory mm -hmm. project. Okay, um, and I'm not gonna take full responsibility for, my, for that idea. That, that was not my idea. I'd like to credit that to one of my coworkers, um, Robin, and we were talking about this coffee and how ridiculous it is that it's expensive and that it passes through the digestive tract of an organism, so it, it just sounds silly. Okay, we can, we can better engineer that system. All right, idea number two, antifreeze. This is also um, something that has been studied before and worked on a little bit. So some organisms um, naturally create their own antifreeze proteins. Um, there are obviously fish that live in very cold temperatures that create antifreeze proteins within their cells and the, 
the obvious purpose of that would be to make sure that they do not freeze at those cold temperatures. So um, wouldn't it be interesting to isolate some of these proteins or find the protein sequence, I'm sorry, and then put anti give antifreeze properties to other organisms. Um, so this has been touched on a little bit. I actually think there might be an iGEM project that dabbled in this, um, but the information for some of these antifreeze proteins are available. The gene sequence is available. Um, many of them are short proteins, so you can you know, get them synthesized and pop them into a vector potentially and give E. coli antifreeze properties if you would want to, or yeast, or apples, or whatever. Um, I mean, you can think, right? So what, were, what are some Is, ideas? Isn't there some agricultural crop that already does Yeah, that? I believe so. It's like yeah. a tomato or an orange or something? Yeah. Or strawberries. Is it strawberries? strawberries? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, you know, that would be the idea. Can we make, you know, give these antifreeze properties to other organisms? What would that look like? Is that a project of interest? <coughs> yes. I mean, it's already been engineered into some organisms, and mm -hmm. some organisms naturally have this, but you could be creative and think of some other um, potential uses yeah. for it. So there's, there's been some ideas in the DIY bio community of like, can we engineer bacteria that could survive on Mars, right? Yeah. Well, obviously cold is some, one of the things he has to take care of, so maybe put one of these in there. Right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great idea. So, um, okay, so that was idea number two. And idea number three is you want to make your E. coli smell like roses. <laughs> And I would personally love this because I work next to a yeast lab and it smells so wonderful in that yeast lab. It smells like bread and beer. And then I walk into my lab and it smells like vomit. So I would much rather my E. coli, my personal E. coli, <laughs> smell like roses. Um, or bananas. Or bananas. Or, or mint. Like Minty E. coli mm -hmm. has been generated as well. Okay. so. We're actually going to, I think what I'm going to do is because this, this hits home and it's personal to me since I work with E. coli every day, I think I personally would like to make the E. coli smell like roses. So I'm thinking like, what do I, what information do I need for this project now, you know, do I go digging through the scientific literature? So where would you go if you wanted to look up literature references, like what's your go-to place of choice, I guess? Dr. Google. Doctor, you go to Google? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone use PubMed anymore? I don't know. Yes? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> um, yeah. PubMed doesn't have everything. PubMed does not have everything. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that's very true. So um, there are many options there. You can go to PubMed. You could go to Google. Google Scholar is pretty good. You know, just random insights on the interwebs. People, you know, tend to throw out their, all their information there. But so you go digging. And then you think, okay, so I want to I make my E. coli smell like roses. Um, what do I need to, what information do I need to know? Like, what's the, what chemical makes E. coli, what chemical makes roses smell like roses? Like, is there a pathway for that? Has that pathway been elucidated? Where do I go find that information, right? There are all these things to think about when, when you're about to start that process. So after some digging, um, not much digging, but <laughs> after a little bit of digging, and I do want to mention that Wikipedia has a nice mm -hmm. collection of, and I think you you emailed this out to Five Curious a while yeah, ago yeah. when we first started talking about this, but um, I forget what it's, it's called. Wikipedia has a nice like aroma there. compounds compilation, so or so you can go and you know you look up the different compounds that are responsible for specific fragrances, and it's a nice chart and it tells you what compound what what, what scent it is and you know some literature references to that. So the, one of the main compounds that gives you this floral scent is geranial. The um, Wikipedia page is under aroma compound, and they've got a long list uh, classified under esters, linear terpenes, cyclic terpenes, and for each of them they say what it smells like, and they have a link to the Wikipedia page on that particular chemical, and then they show the chemical structure, and so. Perfect. It's a really nice starting point. Yeah, it's really good. So I might simultaneously, while talking to you, I'm going to pull up some, you know, web pages, some software that's available, or some sites that are available for you to do some better analysis. But okay, I want to make geranial. Um, that's one of the one of the molecules that's responsible for the floral scent. There are others, right? Every flower has this bouquet of small molecules that make up the full compilation of the fragrance itself. But you know. 
we could we, that would be a very ambitious project to make all these small molecules in the right ratios and make some you know uh, scent overall scent of a flower but right now let's go over one of the, go through one of the main compounds which is geranial so let's look up the biosynthetic pathway so my so what I do now and there are going to be some other options and there are other options to this and there will be some more in the near future but right now the go-to for me at least and I would like anyone else who's done this Patrick to <laughs> to chime in but I typically go to Metapsych. Yeah, it's um, definitely my favorite as well. Is it? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Metapsych, it's a database full, uh, it's been populated with every elucidated metabolic pathway um, from various organisms. So it's not exclusive to a certain organism, it's pathways across many organisms, and if one has been elucidated, it's supposed to be in this database, I believe it pulls from the literature um, what's been published, so that's a good place to go. For, for any of these databases, keep in mind that they will likely be a few years behind in the literature. So something has been figured out like last year, it might not be in there yet, so, so check yeah. the literature too. Actually, when I pull up my web page, it doesn't, okay, that's okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so Metapsych. Um, Metapsych is great, and there are sub, when you go to Metapsych, you'll see there are subcategories. There's like Ecopsych for E. coli and plant psych for plants, and yeah, so that's all. Um, but Metapsych is the meta, it's the compilation of all of those together. Um, so when you go to Metapsych, if you actually type in geranial, I don't know if anyone has their computer and wants to type it in, but if you type in geranial, you actually get options um, <clears throat> to look at the geranial biosynthesis pathway. So you type it in, there's a search bar at the top, and you type geranial, and it pulls up the options, like you can look up the geranial biosynthesis pathway, and it pulls it up. And it tells you, when you click on that pathway, that geranial is produced from the geranol diphosphate pathway. And geranol diphosphate actually, I think, I believe geranol diphosphate spans off into many other um, small molecules, um, but one of which being geranial. And when you look at the organism list, now what it tells you here, so can anyone, does anyone know, like, can anyone decipher maybe what is happening? Here, like, what is, what is it telling you, do you think, on this screen right now? If you guys can see. Well, I can't see, but it looks like it's uh, <laughs> one chemical reaction, and it's, it's consuming, what, an ADH or something like that? Or what, where the thing in the curtain is? No, actually, so it starts from geranyl diphosphate. And then it's kicking <coughs> off the diphosphate. And then it goes to just geranyl. So that's, that's, yeah. that's the, I guess, the, the final step right. in the process, but, yeah. Exactly. You don't see what else is on top. Sure. So you stuff. could, you could click all the way up and mm -hmm. you can, like, go all the way back to the top of the pathway. So this is just focusing on, it's, the, it's just saying it's, it goes up to geranyl diphosphate synthesis, so it makes geranyl diphosphate, and then geranyl diphosphate gets referred to geranial. And it's telling you, in orange, it's telling you what enzymes from what organisms are responsible for that conversion. So it's telling you um, in ZM, does anyone want to take a guess what, the, what ZM organism is? ZMAs. Yeah, exactly. ZMAs. What's ZMAs? Corn. Corn. So um, it's telling you in parentheses the organism that this enzyme comes from. So it's telling you what geranial synthase is from which organism here. Um, what I do not see in that list is an E. So I'm going to, sadly, if you were to go to the drop down list in, on the, on the web page, you would see that E. coli is not an option. So this geranial synth synthesis pathway is not present in E. coli. And further down on the page, it also says expected taxonomic range, range verde planting. Right, so it's only found in plants. Only found in plants. So this present pathway is not present in E. coli. So that's that's okay. So what do you think you need to do next then? So you just found out that the geranial biosynthesis pathway is not present in E. coli. So I we just looked up geranial, the last step in the pathway. E. coli does not make it all the way up to that last step. Are you going to quit now, or what are you going to do next? What's your next best option? Backtrack. Backtrack. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you have to get one chain, one enzyme in there, that's, that's one problem. If you have to get eight enzymes in there, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, yeah, so what, what do you think the next best thing to do is? How do you get to 
uh, journal diphosphate. Absolutely. So, is the precursor present in E. coli? Because if the precursor present, that would be awesome. What would that mean? You would. You just need one enzyme, right? So that would be amazing. Okay, so we go and we look, is geronyl diphosphate present? And, dun, 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 dun. geronyl diphosphate is present in E. coli. So if you were to go back to the metacyc, type in geronyl diphosphate, and pull up the geronyl diphosphate pathway, you would see that geronyl diphosphate biosynthesis pathway is present in E. coli. Great, it just doesn't make geranial. It just doesn't go to that final step. So we just learned previously that all we need to do is get one of these geranial synthase enzymes in potentially, right? And convert the general diphosphate that's already present in E. coli to geranial. That sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, also when you look at that page for the geranial diphosphate biosynthesis, it will also show you what other things can be made from geranial diphosphate. Yeah. So a lot of these uh, odorant <laughs> compounds, if you make a slight variant, it's still some kind of aroma, but it will be a slightly different one. Mm -hmm. So this one goes to menthol um, and a bunch of other things that are aromas in other plants. Right? Very cool. So, so even if you screw something up, it might, th it might still <laughs> smell good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so that would be great. You know, can you make a strain that converts geranial diphosphate to geranial? So where would we get the geranial synthase from then? Um, so the list that they had on the Metis on Metasyc, they had they said that the geranial synthase, that enzyme is present in sweet basil. It's also present in the evergreen tree, in corn, in mint. So a lot of these are commonly um, commonly found at your local grocery store. However, there's a, but we'll talk about why that's probably not the best option to go after that. But, you know, these, the geranial synthase enzyme is present in many organisms that are readily available. Whether that means that you, ice, you get the organism yourself and isolate the gene, or someone else is working on this organism and has the genome available for you to play with, something along those lines. Okay. So, and uh, just to interrupt you, if you're interested in going into this in more detail, we'll have a class on February 16th on the science of, 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 of smell. And we'll go into this a little bit um, more detailed, but also with uh, a lot of experiments that you can try out on, uh, on modifying smells. So. Very cool. Very, was that February when? February 16th. February 16th. Okay, awesome. Um, so... You know, one thing to consider is what organism is available. Like, is it, are you going to be, you know, going after an evergreen tree? And I mean, that seems like not as likely as you being able to get your hands on some corn or mint. Um, but you know, what organism is accessible, and is the geranial synthase sequence known? So why would you need to know? I mean, it's, why would you need to know the sequence information? I mean, what what would be like? What is your? What would be the the best case scenario for for you to get geranial synthase out of an organism and move it over. Cut and paste. Cut and paste. Like you'd be able to just like amplify it up, drop it into a vector, and throw it in your E. coli and express it. Right. Um, however, uh, with plants, with plant genomes, when I'm not a plant biologist, so I would all tell you if you want to study some. Uh, genes and plants, it would be worth your while to talk to Kyle Taylor, our resident plant expert. Um, but plant genomes have introns in them. So unfortunately, what that means is if you were to go right to the genome and try to amplify up your gene right from the genome, your gene might have pieces of DNA in it that don't participate in coding for the final protein, if that makes sense. So what that means is that the gene, when it's converted to RNA, pieces of it are spliced out, and then that mRNA is what leads to your final functional protein. So if you were to just go to your store and run through a plant genomic DNA isolation protocol, which are readily available, um, and you were to amplify up what would be the geranial synthase sequence, you might get a gene that has a bunch of filler DNA in it that does not lead to your functional protein, if that makes sense. So I, we can go through that in more detail later if you're interested, um, but what that means is that you're most likely going to have to get your gene 
sequence elsewhere, not by going to your market and isolating the plant DNA. Um, so if you were to go to NCBI nucleotide, which is where I go for all of my sequence information, um, and you were to type in geranial synthase, and I typed in geranial synthase perilla frutescens or frutescens, which is mint, um, it just gives you mRNA sequence information. So it doesn't give you the DNA, it gives you the mRNA. So what do you think that means? Same thing as a protein sequence, the final protein. It's the same thing as the protein sequence. Right. So what someone did is they isolated the mRNA from the plant. So the mRNA is like the, expre the, expression por the expressing portion of the genome, right? So it's what is going to lead to final protein. So someone isolated the mRNA and then actually converted it to cDNA, which is complementary DNA, in order to, to have a stable form of that product and clone with it and characterize it. So what that means is that the mRNA sequence is available, so you can backtrack to what the DNA sequence is for that gene, which is fine. Um, but that doesn't mean that it was present in that way in the genome. So how would you get the DNA sequence from the mRNA? Um, you would, in theory, have to isolate the mRNA from the plant, make your own cDNA library, and then maybe you know amplify up the amplify up what you want from that in there. Or you can a lot of people working on ZMAs. It's very probably easy to get your hands on a cDNA library from corn or um, from mint. And I think uh, there's someone in Arizona is shipping this stuff out. I looked into it this morning, so it would be easy to do it that way. Um, or as Patrick had mentioned earlier, it could be easy to just synthesize, get your gene synthesized, right? So if you know the sequence for your gene, then you can synthesize it. And I've used both Gen 9, it's hard to see, I apologize, Gen 9 or IDT. So Gen 9, um, Gen 9 costs about 20 cents a base pair. So it could be relatively expensive. So unfortunately, geranial synthase is like 2 KB, which is fairly large. So that would be approximately $400 that you're spending on your gene. But if you can imagine if you're working in, with a team of people and you're getting something synthesized and you're working on a project together, maybe splitting the cost isn't that, um, isn't that daunting. Or you could find your new favorite gene that is smaller and go after something else if, if the cost is an issue. IDT also has something called G-blocks. The cost actually breaks down to relatively the same amount, except Gen 9, take, the way they do their synthesis, it takes them about five, four to five weeks to get your gene product to you. But IDT, you'll get it in about a week. Um, they, they build their sequences slightly differently and analyze them differently, but the cost is approximately the same. Um, so you could go get it synthesized, and of course, we can follow up on that at some point. So what do you think are some considerations? Okay, so we know all this information. You have, you have the RNA sequence. You can get the DNA sequence from that. You can get your gene synthesized. So then when you get your gene synthesized, it comes back to you, and it's just like powdered DNA, double-stranded, like, what, now what? Not to mention pretty much invisible. <laughs> Not to mention invisible. <laughs> Expensive, invisible material. Um, <laughs> what do you, now what? I'm like, I have this tube of DNA and it's expensive and I don't know what to do with it now. Photocopy it. Photocopy it, okay. And what do you mean by that? Make backups. Make backups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually agree with that. They will tell, IDT and I believe, well, IDT will tell you not to photocopy it, meaning not to PCR it up because you'll introduce mutations and all this nonsense, but I still agree with you that, um, if you go about the right way, making copies of the expensive DNA that you get is always a good thing. Um, so photocopy it, okay, that, that could be very important. And then what else? So like how do I go from this chunk of DNA that I synthesize to, to having it expressed functionally in, in uh, E. coli? You can think about promoters. Okay, think put about put promoters. Vector, right? What was that? Put it in a vector. Put it in a vector, yeah. So what's, what's a vector? Something, it's, like a, it's like a virus, right? If you put it in the virus, the virus inserts your gene sequence into the uh, E. coli genome, or you can have like just a plasmid and get that plasmid in there and then it mm -hmm. Sure. So the most common way to introduce DNA into E. coli is using a plasmid, as you said. And um, a plasmid is a double-stranded circular piece of DNA that you can put your genes into and stably, stably f express them in, um, in bacteria. 
or you can also use a plasmid and the plasmid has its own parts for yeast or for plant expression, right? So there are vectors for all different organisms to express your gene in. And these different organisms have different promoters and you know there are a list of that and we'll go over that. Um, do, do any of these the synthesis companies deliver DNA that's already in? in they do. Vector? You can get Gen 9, you can get it in a vector already. <coughs> mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the G blocks. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that though, so it's worth looking into. Question on the, the vectors. Yeah. How do they, the shipping method, is there any kind of like, does it come be frozen? Is it just suspended in some like liquid? Is it just a little bit of auger and it's cool? How does that work? Like, what it's is that it's typically um, lyophilized, meaning it's like dry powder, form of your DNA. It's not resuspended with anything. Oh, so, so to say like if they send it, <clears throat> if they send it with the novel DNA sequence already transfected into like whatever microbe you want to work with. They don't actually put it in the microbe, they just send you the plain DNA. Okay, so, yeah. okay, so nobody should figure out that. Yeah, so no, but, but their Gen 9, I believe, actually Gen 9, I think they do their synthesis and they send it to you in liquid, in water. Um, but... It, hidden in Barbasol. <laughs> hidden in cans, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you'll get a, you know, from Gen 9, I think, I don't know if they always do, but, you know, they'll send a liquid. IDT, it's always, everything I've received has always been just lyophilized. They do not put it in the organism for you. So, so I'm the, curious, is there, a, is there a shelf life or a lifeline for that? I mean, after, like, yeah. three years, you just go, oh, this is no longer... I mean, if you've taken the, care of your DNA, like, if you... You keep it cold and you uh, wear wear gloves while working with it, as to not get any di like enzymes that would degrade your DNA in your you know in your sample. You it will last like I mean I've I've the only time I've ever seen DNA degrade is if I've been poor at you know keeping it at the right temperature and it's been out on my bench for an extended period of time and I run it on a gel and I see it's turned into like this mess of a sample that you know it's not running to the right size on my gel anymore um but if, if you take care of it, it's like years i mean i i can't say i've worked with anything post five and, years of having it maybe but and, and plasma I dna mean, because it's a small circle is very stable yeah. as well so yeah. matt cowell for example has been talking about just sending plasmids across the country, just putting a droplet on filter, filter paper, paper. On, on a postcard. Uh. That's how I, like, if sometimes if I have to send plasmids to people, I just put them on a piece of filter paper. And then they just take some water and pipette over the spot where I drop the DNA and they suck mm -hmm. it up. I mean, it's it's very hard, surprisingly yeah. extremely hardy. Yeah. You could literally put it on the back of a postage stamp and sort of... So yeah. you, could have, you could have a, a library, a, da a data storage you chamber like <laughs> of these and no, basically... Absolutely. They talk about this, like mm -hmm. research has been done about long-term storage of yeah. DNA and specifically like the weight to um, information density ratio is massive. Like it, it just destroys everything else out of there, save for the fact that it's really hard to read and write. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so think about that next time you send something in the mail, um, which is a funny story because someone was telling me that they like someone, some company that was synthesizing DNA just like sent them a promo, like and it was just like some random sequence of DNA that they got in the mail and they're a little weirded <laughs> out by the fact that they just got this sample of unknown DNA, you know. It's like, hey, click on this link. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So somehow you have to make this piece of DNA express, um, and multiple things we're throwing out, like getting it into a vector and all this stuff. So maybe there are some things to consider uh, when you're getting your gene synthesized. So like, well, you know, you're getting your DNA synthesized, and you know you have to clone it. You know, you have to put it in a vector, and there are a couple of ways. Like, how would how would you put a gene in a vector in a plasmid? Like, well, what do you think you need to do in order to get a piece of DNA into a plasmid? I know some of you are already know this. Who does not know this? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you, so someone who knows how to do this then? What do you have to do to get a piece of DNA? Use vector. restriction enzymes. Okay. <laughs> so you have to use restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes digest your DNA at specific sequences. So, and leaves complementary, leaves overhangs. Okay. So pretty much what happens is, is, um, 
if you have your gene of interest here, so it has, your gene of interest has these blunt ends here, right? So if these are like your nucleotides, whatever your gene is, it has these blunt ends. And then, you know, this is your vector. And somehow you need to get your piece of DNA into your original plasmid vector was just a circle. And you get your gene in the mail like this, and you want to put this into your closed circle plasmid. How are you going to do that, right? Um, so one way would be uh, what one would just call cut and paste. So cutting and pasting meaning I have a restriction enzyme site here, and then I have the matching restriction enzyme site here, such that when I cut, like maybe it's a en restriction enzyme called EcoR1, when I cut, these overhangs that are generated here match up, and this piece can ligate in. And then the same thing would be on the other side of the gene, I have maybe BAM H1 site, which is another, and you'll get into this when you get into cloning, but you know, this would be the cut and paste. I have the, the same site on the vector, so if I cut the vector with ECO and BAM, and I cut my gene with ECO and BAM, they'll have complementary overhangs, and I throw some ligase in there, and they ligate together, and I get a circle with my gene in it. So that would be, yeah. Um, the, uh the synthesized piece, the straight bar. Yeah. Is it? Does it end with? Like, can you choose what it ends with? Bingo. Yeah, you hit on an extremely important point. So when you get your gene synthesized, maybe something to consider is maybe you just don't want like start codon to stop codon of your gene. Maybe you want a little extra sequence that has restriction enzyme sites at the end, right? Now, if you didn't do that when you synthesize your gene, you can do what Matt was saying, and you could just order primers to amplify up your synthesized gene with, with restriction sites on the end, right? Those are both. I thought primers started, it doesn't say when to stop, right? Your template, your template and the forward and reverse primer give the with the start and stop positions of your of your PCR. So like But how do you add the restriction code? Sure. So you would have a primer, like if this was your, you know, this is your gene you're amplifying, you would have the primer that binds here, but then you would have extra nucleotides hanging off to the end. Oh. So your your restriction site would be here and then the same thing here, site here. And then they amplify they amplify through to the ends. And going through the steps of PCR, like how, how you brought up an excellent point, like how, what defines start and stop of a PCR, going through the steps of how PCR works um, is, is, would be a nice like, demonstration. So I think at some point we should go through that. Um, so you can do it that way. How do you um, merge the, uh, I forget, how do you merge restriction enzyme with the, the end pair and then bond that to your, your, your cut? Um, gene that you wanted to put into your vector. So how do I ligate this into my vector? Is that like after you cut it? Because you need that end stop for it to read on both sides, right? For it to read across and merge. Um, are you talking about p during PCR? Uh, during your ligation. You need the end stop. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure I'm Cause, following. Because you said you had an end point that you, like a little bit cut out. Sure. Okay. So after you digest with restriction enzymes, if you've used a restriction enzyme that leaves an overhang, right, you will have the end of your product now might look something like this with an overhang here and an overhang here, right? So what you're drawing there is, is sort of the two strands of the DNA, Exactly. Right? And yeah. one, one of the strands is cut a little bit farther than the, the other yeah, strand. Yeah, right. So it looks like this, you know, like this. And then there are free nucleotides here and free nucleotides here. And assuming your vector matches and has the same complementary pieces free after you've digested, then you can ligate. Does that make sense? Like that. You hope. You hope. Yeah. One would hope. But if that's yeah. not clear, we can go through that in more, you know, more detail. And there's the restriction enzymes that just cut both strands at exactly yeah. the same place. There's one that are cause these offset these overhangs 
there's uh, restriction enzymes that recognize the <coughs> sequence and then cut next to it. Mm -hmm. So you can do all kind of fun stuff with that as well. Yeah, so that's, um, I, yeah, I bring that, that's Golden Gate cloning, which is actually, and then, and then I'd like to say it's advanced cloning. <laughs> so once you understand how enzymes cut and make overhangs, then um, Golden Gate cloning, like Patrick said, is instead, so these enzymes, they just bind to a site and cut at that site. Um, Golden Gate cloning uses enzymes called type 2 restriction enzymes where they sit on the site, but they cut like X number of nucleotides away, um, which is beneficial for many reasons. And we'll, I think you get a better handle on why it's beneficial once you go through some molecular biology um, talk. But, but so we bring up a good point. No matter whether you're going to use BAMH1 or ECO R1 or type 2 restriction enzyme for Golden Gate cloning or whatever it is, like, what do you have to consider about when you get your gene synthesized then? Like, if you know when you get your gene back, you're going to be cutting it with X enzyme or X enzymes, what is important to understand, to, like, ensure when you get your gene synthesized? You want to make sure it doesn't have a BAM or eco site in internal. Exactly. So whatever you're going to clone with, you just want to make sure those restriction sites aren't already present in your gene, right? Because... That's a huge problem because you don't want to chop up your gene when you're trying to clone it. Your very expensive gene that you just ordered from Gen 9 when you're trying to clone it into your vector, right? Um, so the great thing about getting something synthesized is that if you know what the protein sequence is, the final protein sequences that you want, because of the wobble codons, right, because there are multiple codons for each amino acid, you can alter the nucleotide sequence such that you make sure there are no restriction enzyme sites present or no restriction enzymes that present that you are going to be cloning with, but you never change the amino acid sequence. So that could also be a fun. Now, these software programs exist. You can, like, throw in your protein sequence and um, convert it back to DNA, and then, you know, there are ways to change the sequence such that certain restriction enzyme site isn't present, but you're keeping the protein sequence. So that could be a fun software project. Um, for anyone that's interested in doing something computational is like writing some software to writing some tools that you know could be used for that process like if you're getting a gene and so you could easily select like I want to make sure my gene so you don't have to manually go through and change the restriction site and then make sure you didn't change the protein sequence you could just have a program that says like I want to make sure my gene is this protein sequence but doesn't have any eco bam bsa1 pst1 ZO1, whatever, and you're, it's like a drop down, and you get your, your endpoint, your DNA, and then you can just send it right off for sequencing, you know. And if you'd like to begin to learn more about how to do this, we have a class <laughs> December 17th. That's awesome. That's Craig's, right? That's Craig's uh, class. So uh, Tuesday, December 17th, that's coming up next week. Is, is he going so, through cloning? Through um, he's mm -hmm. going through pieces of that. So, of uh, okay. so uh, and, yeah. and obviously we will have lots of classes uh, on. Primer design. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about those considerations. Okay, so, you know, we get our geranial synthase protein. Like I said, you can go and there's, there's software available. I like Greg Thatcher. I don't know who he is. But someone named Greg Thatcher wrote this program that you can enter your protein sequence in and it'll reverse, reverse it back to the DNA sequence, right? So I like using it. I don't know. Or, or that's why I say it would be nice to write your own all-encompassing tool that does multiple functions. Because right now I go to many different places to do different functions as opposed to, like, wouldn't it be great if all these resources were in, like, one package that you guys generated. I think that would be cool. So uh, another fun thing about moving from plants to bacteria is they have much different codon yeah. usage. Yeah, so I wasn't going to talk about that, but I didn't. Um, because recently it's being determined that it's not as important as people originally thought it was. There's still like mixed results on that. So what you're saying is codon Another thing to consider is do you want to optimize your um, gene sequence for codon usage in that specific organism? Meaning, not every organism has the same TNA, tRNA is present, right? It's so like not every organism, so you know, you know when you go from DNA sequence to amino acid sequence, DNA, RNA, amino acid, you, it's, it's, you recognize the codons, the three nucleotide regions that are present in your DNA and what that codes for, for amino acid, right? Um, so not every organism uses the same codons to the same ratios. And 
like you were mentioning, there's also software available such that you're saying you're going from plant to E. coli. E. coli has, you know, different ratios of charged tRNAs present. Maybe you would want to optimize your gene sequence such that it can now utilize the, the, the tRNA, um, I don't know what you call it, pool that is present in E. coli versus plant because it might be different. Um, and there's mixed, there's mixed feelings. That's something that was very standard for a while. People would always optimize their genes um, for the organism that they're going into. Um, but that seems to be shifting quite a bit. And there's hazy research on that. So um, I guess for now, maybe you would want to do it just to be sure. But we're seeing that it might not be making a difference. Um, but I don't know. Do you have experience with it? Because if you noticed a difference, then that would be. I mean, every time I. I, I've seen it compared when you have big metabolic pathways, it makes a <coughs> tremendous difference. That could be my mm -hmm. limited experience with it. But sure. Every time I, I've seen some pathway that they're trying to break down lignin or do something fancy with um, bacteria, getting it into <coughs> the bacterial uh, codon pool it mm -hmm. has a a significant difference in how it yeah how but it, it but it's not up. always easy to predict exactly how it's going to improve it. yeah so typically you make a couple of different versions and then just mm -hmm. test which one yeah. works better and, <laughs> and it could be <laughs> something slowly. too as you're expressing more things maybe it becomes more important right because you are potentially over expressing right. um, mm -hmm. multiple genetic elements and then like you were saying maybe the effect is seen more so when you're you know expressing entire pathway if you're just expressing one or two genes maybe it's not as much so but mm -hmm. that's definitely something to consider right. yeah definitely if you're going to take something out of a plant and put it in a bacteria I would definitely try and optimize it would you <laughs> it would probably make it better <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was point number one. Do you want to code on optimize the organism you are expressing in? Um, so that's also something to consider. And okay, so thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so you have, so you know, I when you put it in this reverse translate lovely thing, you get out your DNA sequence, and um, it is much longer than what you see on the screen. So represented by the represented by the dots, but um, you can take your gene sequence and then play around with it. So my favorite tools, even though people are moving away from APE, it's not that great, I guess, but I'm used to it and I like it. So APE is a plasmid editor and it's free, free software. So you can download it and what you can do is you can like manipulate your gene sequence. So you can put it in a file and you can check for restriction sites. You can add nucleotides to it. You can put vector sequences in there and like map all the important components of your vector. You can make your your own, um, you can make your own library, meaning that you can, you can highlight a sequence that's maybe the origin of replication of your vector or the promoter and you label it so that every time you pull up a new DNA sequence, it like automatically searches your DNA for those specific um, regions. You can do a lot of things with it. So a plasma editor, a lot of people love Snapchain. Snapchain's great. I like Snapchain. Snapchain, there's a free version, and there's a paid-for version. The paid-for version's a little souped up, and it's, it is quite nice. It's nicer than the basic um, version of Snapchain that's free, but those are great. And also Benchling. Um, I just started using Benchling, and they, I believe they came out of, yeah, they came out of Y Combinator, and um, they're making some excellent DNA analysis manipulation software. And it's all done. They keep all the information on their database or on a server, and it's nothing's like actually on your computer, which is really nice. It frees up a lot of space. But what's really wonderful is that you can enter all of your DNA information. Like you have a plasmid that you're using, and you put it up there, and it's annotated. Every modification you make to that vector, it logs it, so you can see every iteration of your vector all in one place. You can link it to literature resources. You can link it to a piece of data. Um, and you can share all this with someone else. So if you're working on a project with someone, you could imagine like if you're using the same pieces of DNA, you're using the same vector, it would be really easy to have, to be using something like Benchlink such that you can see all the iterations that you both made on something and link it to your own data. And um, you can also make a list, a database of your primers and you can automatically search like every vector against all of those that you've made so that you're not like, what, what happens in our lab sometimes is, you know, I've made my, we keep Google Docs of everything, and everyone has their own Google documents of their DNA files and things of their DNA, and, you know, every oligo that I get synthesized, I have my own personal Google Doc that other people can see, 
but like maybe they need to use a primer and they just don't want to feel like digging through my stuff because it's going to be really difficult to figure out my annotation. So they like reorder something very similar. And then you end up spending more money than you need to. So, if, so benchling is great so you can make these shared oligo repositories and scan each, you know, it's very nice. The name is benchling. Benchling, yeah. Like bench, L-I-N-G. As in henchling. As in henchling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is kind of like Snap Gene with better version control and collaboration features. Exactly, yeah. It's pretty good. So they're still in beta, I believe, but I would check it out. And they keep on rolling out new updates. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really good service. So I believe if you're a company, you pay for the software or you pay for the use of the service. But if you are an individual researcher, academic researcher, or something along those lines, um, it's free. <coughs> Um, okay. What, what do you guys use for? Are using benchling. benchling. You're using okay. benchling as well. Okay. And how are you finding it? Uh, I haven't used it yet. Okay. But I think Kyle does like it. Okay. Cool. Um, so another great thing with some of the software is like you know let's say you want to run your plasmid on a gel or something like that and you cut it up with some enzymes and you're expecting to see DNA of certain sizes on your agarose gel, you know, you can use this to predict or determine like what size fragments you should see. I mean, there are all, all these things. It's important to have some sort of plasmid editing tool that you use regularly, whatever it is, because if you're going to clone, you need it. So um, you should do that. Okay, so this is just an example. Like I could copy and paste the geranial synthase DNA into an ape file, and I can highlight the restriction sites, and I can add things on it. I can visualize it in linear form. I can make it circular if I want to, even though I'm not going to because it's on a plasmid, so I don't want to make it circular and all this stuff. Um, okay, great. So I've ordered my gene, and I've made sure that there are no sites in it that I don't want and all, and all that good stuff. And, I, and you know, I, I went with Patrick, and I codon code optimized it. And... Um, <laughs> And now I want to put it into E. coli. So we kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know what important components, we, we didn't really get into the details. So important components for expression in E. coli. So you have a plasmid. What needs to be on that plasmid for you to, so you mentioned that there needs to be a promoter to drive gene expression, OK? Um, but, and, and maybe restriction enzyme sites. We talked about that, right, to clone your, your piece of DNA in. But what else, you can't just like, what have, you just throw this circular piece of DNA with a promoter in, with your gene in, in cells, like, now what? Like, what, what, what needs to happen? Like, one copy of your plasmid in there is going to express your gene, or, like, what has to be on that, on that vector, on that plasmid, in order to actually get ex good expression off of, that, off of that plasmid, do you think? And then how do you know if your cells actually took up that plasmid? Yeah, so you need to make sure it has origin of replication. Okay. And then some kind of selectable marker, although maybe you could just sniff it for rose scent, I suppose. You could <laughs> in, sniff in it. Particular you, yes, in this particular case, you can. You can't you put, couldn't you put <laughs> the, an antibiotic marker and then grow it? Sure. So, it so that's what Jamie was mentioning is a selectable marker, so that's important. So can you explain what, what a selectable marker does for those that don't know? Uh, sure. So the problem we have here is we have this whole, you know, millions of E. coli cells, only some of them are going to take up the plasmid. And so we need a way to know which cells took up that plasmid. And so uh, you mentioned the, the antibiotic, antibiotic resistance. That's the most common way to do that. And so basically you're going to put all those cells, the ones that some have plasmid, some don't, you put it all onto plates that have antibiotic, and it'll kill all the cells that didn't take the plasmid. Only the cells that took up that plasmid are protected from the antibiotic because that plasmid has a gene that gives them resistance. Awesome. And, and in theory, you could use a reporter <coughs> gene and then make a whole bunch of colonies and pick out the ones that have the reporter gene. But so, in practice, you might be dealing with like one in a million or something, right? Yeah, it depends. Um, you bring up an, an interesting point. So like that's something I do now sometimes is, so you're saying to make sure that your gene expressed have a reporter no, it's just, gene? Oh, you just mean just to, to see if your plasmid was taken yeah, up? Yeah, just get the, 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 the yeah. cells that have actually taken up the plasmid. Yeah. Could be as low as one in a million or worse. Yeah. It might be better in that case to do a selection than a screen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the difference between that and a selection is you're selecting for survive. So like what you want survives, and that's a selection. As opposed to a screen, whereas what you want is just like phenotypically different, and then you have to like check through everything to pull out the right phenotype, and, you know. Um, Okay, so 
Great. Selectable marker. You mentioned origin of replication. What's an origin of replication? Uh, that's going to be a DNA sequence that will allow the plasmid to, to copy itself once it's inside the cell. Because otherwise, you know, if you're just, if the plasmid goes into an E. coli cell, as that E. coli keeps dividing, that, if that plasmid's not also replicating, it's just going to get diluted out, right? So you, need, you want the plasmid to copy itself as the big bacterial cell is copying itself so that it's always going along. And so there's a very specific sequence you need. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Um, so you, you can think of the plasma, I guess, as a little chromosome. So like, you know, there's the, the bacterial cell has its bacterial chromosome, and it has to replicate every time it's going to divide. And so you want that plasma to also replicate every time the cell divides. And so you just have to make sure the plasma has that DNA sequence that the DNA replication machinery will recognize and, and copy it. And, and some bacteria actually have multiple chromosomes, right? So they actually have to coordinate how fast their chromosomes will will divide and, and multiply simultaneously with the multiplication of the cells. Otherwise, you wind up with zero or two copies of the chromosome. Right? So the, these plasmids do something along the same lines. They try to synchronize their, their replication with the, uh, with the cell cycle. Yep. So um, another point to mention is that the origin of replication, like there isn't necessarily just one standard origin of replication you can choose. You can choose origins that will replicate uh, varying copy numbers of your, or lead to varying copy numbers of your plasmid. So like, let's say you express your gene and your cells don't grow very well. Maybe they're a little toxic or sickly or uh, you don't reach saturation, you know, when you grow them or something along those lines. Maybe you're over-expressing your protein. And one thing to look at is maybe you're using a high copy plasmid, meaning maybe your origin of replication is making 100 copies of your, of your plasmid per cell as opposed to maybe you want to dial down and just do 10 and see if having less protein present, you know, reduces the toxicity or something along those lines. Like, these are all things to kind of play with and think about, but it's important that your vector is replicating inside of your cell. Um, so... so Oh. And then there's other sequences that you can put in, in the vector that sort of ensure that it's not going to get lost, essentially. Right? So there's there's a way of, of sort of making the cell is addicted to having that plasmid, essentially. And that gives you much more reliable uh, mm -hmm. presence of that plasmid in, in the genes, in the, the cells. Mm -hmm. Do people have plasmids? Do people have plasmids? What do you think? Well, who knows where plasmids were isolated from? Does anyone know the history of, of where? E. coli. Okay, so the, so bacteria carry plasmids, or what? So, what do you think? Do you think humans have? Pla well, do, well, that's a loaded question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I definitely have plasmids somewhere in me afterward. <laughs> yeah, but do human cells have? Do, do you mean do I, mammalian I, I, cells I, I, have plasmids? I, 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 I think <laughs> I, I think humans do in their mitochondria. Okay. Mm. Because mitochondria are round, like plasmids. So little or they're like they're like mini organisms within the organism. We can all call the plasmid. It's the same idea. Wait, so so these are mitochondrial plasmids that are not the mitochondrial DNA. No, it's no, we're the mitochondria it. itself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loop, just like the plasmids. Uh, it's a, it's a, a little but it's bit in of its own stretch. compartment. Yeah. All right, so, yeah. Anyway. Um. Maybe the bacteria in my body have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, yeah, there are other things that you need as well. So if you're expressing in E. coli, you have origin replication, the selectable marker to make sure your cells actually took up your plasmid. Um, the RBS we didn't really touch on, but at least in, back in E. coli, after the promoter, there's a region called the ribosome binding site that you need. So that's where the ribosome sits in order to make your protein. Um, Yeast don't have RBSs, they don't have ribosome binding sites, they don't have they don't need this procedure. So yeast it's actually just promoter than gene, which is really nice. Um, needing an RBS adds another element of confusion to the cloning issue because um, you have to think about now, you know, a lot of reasons why things don't express is because maybe now there's a canonical RBS sequence that the Shine Del Garner sequence, which is this AGG AGG sequence. Um, you should look into that. <laughs> that is, you know, at a certain spacing before the start of your gene. Um, however, that canonical sequence doesn't work with every gene context, meaning 
like the end terminal nucleotides of your gene might not fare well with the RBS you have present and maybe the ribosome, you know, can't read through that mRNA structure well or something happens there and you don't get good expression off that RBS. So not only do you think people think about changing copy number of their vector if their expression's not going well, people also think about changing out the RBS. Like you can make a library, just like we talk about making a promoter library, you can make a library on your RBS and select for your best expressor there. Um, uh, you can change your promoter. If your promoter is too high, you can go back to a lowering, lower expression promoter. You can use an inducible promoter, meaning you add a small molecule and your promoter drives expression only in the presence of that small molecule, right? There are all these other systems you can think about. So it's not it's just cut and dry, like you have a promoter, you have an RBS, your gene, and then sometimes there's a terminator there, um, all these things, and then it's like express. That is the best case scenario. Like everything you started with in the beginning leads to expression of your gene. That's awesome. But if it doesn't work out, you know there are many things to play with. Um, so, you know, if you need to get a better handle on the various origins of replication that you can use, Open Wetware has a really nice collection of um, of different origins of re replication. Like what's a high coli one, which is like a high expressing origin of replication. Um, there are lower like PSC, PSC. O one or PSCO, don't quote me. You know this is but, like P one five A is lower expressing. You know, but typically like you that. wouldn't really design your own vector, right? You would take a vector that you know has certain properties. And, sure. Right. Um, yes, I mean you wouldn't necessarily design your own vector, but it at least gives you an idea. Like if you're in a high copy number vector and it's toxic you can go look up what are the origins of replication of lower copy vectors mm -hmm. and find a lower copy vector to use, right? So just like having this information accessible. Or, you know, maybe it is easy for you to like clone in and out an origin, probably not. It's probably gonna be easier for you to just move your gene to a different vector, but mm -hmm. just being able to like look up all this information, it's really important. Um, because it's not like, when you start cloning, you're probably gonna be working with vectors, like puck vectors, these very standard vectors that have high origins of replicate, uh, uh, high copy number, which is fine, and it's great for just learning how to clone, but then when you actually go to wanting to express something, um, there are, other things that you may want to be able to manipulate. Um, um, so if you also want to get a full list of promoters that are available, the iGEM parts page has a really great, the registry has a really great compilation of just all the different types of promoters that are available, whether it's like constitutive. What's constitutive mean? Same. Constitutive. Constantly on. Constantly on. So like you'll have a list of constantly on promoters that can be constantly on high, constantly on medium, constantly on low. Um, it could be a series of inducible promoters, right? So this is a great resource to go to. And then um, as and then the RBS, they also have a, the iGEM also has a list of different ribosome binding sites. And um, then there are the list of cloning vectors, which Open Wetware also has a nice compilation of. So that's what Patrick was saying. Like, if you know that you want to move into another vector, just look up another vector and then get your hands on it. And so that's why I say like the most useful resources are going to be the people around you because everyone's going to have everyone <coughs> is going to have access to or know someone who has access to or something to a different to a plasma that you might need. You know, so you might be using a constitutive promoter and want the PBAD promoter, which is a rabinose inducible promoter, because you know, like you want to be able to turn your protein on at a certain stage in growth or something along those lines, then you know, you just ask around and be like, hey, do you have a PBAD vector? And I think even I think P glow is a PBAD vector, um, if I'm not mistaken. So you know, it's just like you just hear, you know, you talk to people and find who has what vectors at their disposal and then you'll know what set of components you have to work with. Um, and then you obviously can also purchase a lot of vectors from like AdGene, um, ATCC probably has some, I, maybe, I don't know. AdGene is probably my go-to place, but they're fairly expensive. Um, so, you know, send some stuff on some filter paper. I didn't say that, but <laughs> but if you want to, I don't just don't know about it. Okay, so you, you will ask people around the components you need. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I'm fuzzy on the difference between a promoter and a and an, an RBS. Because I I thought a ribosome is what makes the copy of DNA. Ribosome is for protein. 
translation. Yeah, sorry. So you have the promoter that's going to drive transcription of your gene, so that's going to make the RNA. And then you have the site, the ribosome binding site, where the ribosome sits in order to make protein off of that RNA. Right. So, so it's so like the this messenger two RNA will have some untranslated region up front, essentially, and that's where the ribosome binding site is. That sort of regulates how that messenger RNA is then being translated into protein. Promoter site makes RNA, ribosome binding site makes protein? Regulates, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's before the, start, uh, before the start codon? Correct. That's before the start codon of your gene. Um, okay, so we talked about this already. Okay, so once you have your gene in your vector, whether it was through, you know, you design your synthesized gene and you're just going to clone it right in because your synthesized gene has the sites you need on the end of it or you're amplifying it up to put the sites on the end of it, you're going to put it into your vector and it's going to be really easy and it's going to work the first time. And then you're going to put it into some cells and, and transform it. So the purpose, the initial first part of this is if you transform it right into cells, your clone vector, what are you going to do to confirm that you made the right construct? So I pretty much mentioned it down there, but for those that can't see, um, you know, you clone your gene into your vector, you're putting it into, into bacteria just for the first stage of cloning, like just to make sure you made your construct collect correctly. Like what do you need to do? Like how do you verify Right, because like you're going to cut your DNA, it's just like colorless liquids, you're moving around to different tubes and you're just going to hope that you cut it and that you ligated this small volume of things together and then you're going to throw it into cells. Could do like, a gel? You could do a gel, okay. So, so at what point would you do the gel? Like, what, what do you think you need to do? Like, right after cloning and ligating, is there is that going to be enough DNA to see on a gel, do you think? Probably it depends, not. It depends how big your, your reaction is, but <laughs> probably not. So what would be the best thing to do, do you think? PCR. Okay. Um, what would, what, okay, so what do you mean by that? What would uh, you do to PCR? Uh, PCR would be to photocopy, uh, to verify that you have, all of the pieces between two, okay. uh, two, so, uh, so you're saying like once you had your gene in here, you would PCR like across the junction, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. And then, <coughs> well, that so that might be hard. Okay, so in your ligation reaction, though, is every vector that every vector going to be ligated to? Do you think like it's going to be one to one, like everything's going to be? Like, might you get some self, maybe you'll get some self-ligated. You shouldn't, but you might. Maybe you'll get, or maybe it'll just be background that never got digested, right, things like that. So, like, what would be the best way to tease all this apart? Like, after you've ligated your piece of DNA into your vector, what would be, like, how do you isolate that one clone that worked to move forward? So, we you just throw it all in your cells? Okay. So, you would transform it, yeah into bacteria and, and then, then do your selection right uh, okay it's only the um only the bacteria that took out the plasma correctly would exist and replicate correct so you'll have colonies right that yeah. are surviving that took up your vector so it could that could have taken up vectors that have your gene in it or vectors that never got digested or potentially self-ligated right well I, I, you're, I, I, that's you, right you're right you're right, but you would get a mix, yeah, of but colonies. The, um, back, the antibiotic resistance is only in the piece that you put in, not in the vector, right? No, the antibiotic resistance is actually in the backbone of the vector. Oh, well then so that, that you that yeah it does, but that is still what you do. You still take your pool of DNA and transform it into bacteria, and then you have a plate. You have a plate of colonies, so one colony started from what? One CFU. Okay. One colony. Single CFU cell. is, is yeah. one from one cell, yeah. so a CFU is a colony forming unit, yeah? So a single cell picked up, a single cell picked up your vector, you plated it, and now you get colonies. 
Um, so how are you going to check which colony's got the right, got this and not this? You're going to have to sequence it. You'll have to sequence right. it, yeah. So pretty much what you do is, this touches on something Matt mentioned actually, is you can do something, you can do um, sequencing use doing colony PCR. So you can set up a PCR reaction actually just like picking some cells from your colony and putting it in a tube and you can PCR the DNA inside that colony. And you could set up a reaction that's like this. So if you get something of the correct size off that colony, then most likely your gene's in. If you get something that's really small, right, your gene's not in. Um, and you can send that for sequencing. Uh, and then simultaneously, like while you're putting some cells in a tube for PCR, you put some cells in a tube for a mini prep. And like whichever sequence correctly, you mini prep the DNA, meaning you isolate the plasma DNA from your cells. So you, you inoculate a culture from that colony, grow it up, you mini prep your DNA, isolate the plasma, and then you have the plasmid to move forward with. Um, I'm not familiar with mini prep. Okay, so a mini prep is when you, it's a pl plasmid prep. So you would take your colonies, so what you would do is you would pick your colonies into tubes or blocks or whatever full of media. So you're like, you take some of this and put it in here and that and there. Um, so you have individual colonies that you grew up, so they're individual clones, right, because this is a clonal population from the starting cell. And then you pretty much spin down these cells, get rid of the media, you break them open, um, and spin out the genomic DNA and the debris, cell debris, and through a series of, you bind, you bind that, what's left, the liquid that's left that has your plasmid into a membrane, and you wash it and get all the salts away, and then you elute that plasmid, and then you have your final plasmid in the end. Th th there are some other steps in there, but it's a very simple way to like, lice your cells open, isolate the plasmid DNA without the other cellular junk. And, um, and then you get a plasmid. So, so then you could send that vector for that plasmid for sequencing, like with a primer that bound here. So, so if, you, if your uh, DNA synthesis company gives you the vector with your sequence on there, that's a tiny, tiny amount. At this point, you've really amplified it up and you have massive amounts of that little plasmid mm -hmm. that you now can store for later use. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and you can save this and do whatever you want with it. And you can, obviously, the clone that works, you can keep on retransforming and, you know, make more and more of it if you need to and things like that. Can we isolate this DNA the same way we isolated our, our, our DNA from our spit with alcohol? It's very similar. Yeah, it's very similar. Um, but... Except you won't it, be able to yeah. roll it up on a tube. Yeah. <laughs> the steps are similar. Little circles. So. Um, but it's not, and it's not as clean. You won't, you won't get some, you won't get nice, pure. Yeah, and actually for E. coli or any organism, there's a separate genomic DNA extraction versus plasma DNA. Like a mini prep specifically actually gets rid of your genomic DNA. In theory, almost all of it. So that you're only left with your plasmid DNA and not the genomic. Um, but yeah. Um, so, you have, you, ver you sign up for sequencing, you verified your clone, and then you're going to take your clone and retransform it into whatever strain you want to express it in, which is some E. coli strain, right? Probably, since we're doing this in E. coli. And, um, and then how will you know if you're making germinal? At this point, you smell it. At this point, you smell it. So hopefully, yes, actually, it does smell like roses. And then you'd be really happy that you know, you grew up this large culture and it's very floral and you have this new strain that you can work with in the lab and you don't have to work around bad smelling E. coli anymore. Um, so what do you do when it doesn't smell like Yeah, what do you do when it doesn't smell the like The DNA is there, you check your <laughs> PCR and it's not smelling oh. like roses. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> there are many, okay, so let's say it doesn't smell like geranial. Does that mean it's not making geranial? There might be that's something that also needs to be expressed that you forgot. That needs that's to be all. That's part. a possibility. Like maybe you have to, maybe you have to build up the proteins that are higher up in the metabolic pathway to make it like an abundance of the precursors all the way down the pathway. So maybe it's not as simple just putting the one gene in. Maybe you had to overexpress other proteins in the pathway to like bump up the levels of precursors all the way down. Or, or the maybe gene. you have to turn <laughs> off something that uses some of that. A precursor. Right? Yes, maybe your precursor is getting like cycled into another pathway or something, and or there's a weird feedback loop and it's like 
or like, you know, repressing something. That's maybe, always a thing. Maybe the problem is your DNA. Maybe you're missing the gene variant that allows you to smell roses and you just... <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. You just need someone else to come over. It's and entirely like, yeah, possible. That's possible. <laughs> and then, then you realize everyone's like playing a game with you because everyone maybe else can smell it and you can't. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's definitely true. And we'll be uh, also in one of our classes <laughs> <laughs> next Sunday. Uh, everybody tastes differently. So uh, you're, you're welcome to come and find out whether you can taste or not taste certain things in nature. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> um, so maybe, okay, so let's not get down to like doomsday and you're not making anything yet. Um, there's one way, this might be doomsday because it's expensive, but if you're not smelling geranium, it doesn't mean you're not making it. So what's commonly done is LCMS to check to see if your compound's being produced. So LCMS is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And you pretty much pass your sample through a column um, and you use a mobile phase or a liquid phase that's a different ratio of hydrophilic to hydrophobic components. And your, your small molecule comes off at the column at the right ratio of mobile phase, or, you know, and then it gets shot into a mass spec. You know, it's ionized and gets shot into a mass spec. And then you see a peak at your, you see a peak at the molecular weight of your molecule. It's much more complicated than that, but that's the, that's the overview. And, and this um, kind of stuff is a little bit harder to do for a DIY. Like. Absolutely. Right. It's difficult to do today. Um, today. today. Yes. That yeah. may change. We're changing it. Yes. yes. And it is, if you were to outsource this, like if you were to give your samples to a facility, which is, a, which is possible, like we could form collaborations with core facilities and give your set samples to uh, a mass spec facility and have them run it for you. That would be expensive though, because you're paying for like their time and also the time on the machine and awesome. But but that's the kind of services that Science Exchange, for example, yes, offers. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if I could possibly mind the crowd here real quick, but I heard a rumor that somebody around here is working on a mass spec that you could like mount on your arm. <laughs> Does anybody know anything about this? <laughs> like a response? This was your claim, right? It sounds absolutely fantastic. I, I heard it through, uh, I'm not going to say, but if anybody happens to know or like wants to give me a hint about it, I'd love to talk to you. I think I heard about that. It wasn't exactly in mass spec. It was like, or maybe it was in a weird way that you used a laser, but it seemed like a I mean, there's, spec. there's the ramen spec one mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I saw on uh, Indiegogo, but yeah, that's that's a ramen uh, Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Mm. Right. I don't know. But I have not heard that rumor. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I'm putting an ARM processor on my spec. <laughs> Same thing. Now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the the game of telephones, yeah. right? What do I do? Yeah. LCMS. I mean, yeah. do you, is this like you walk over to your machine, or is this a department that you... Yeah, so in, our, in my building, there's a mass spec facility, actually. So, um, yes. Oh, yeah, like, are you I running the machine my, yourself? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for $89,000, you, you could have one of your own. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely an intense training, and it's not just like you can walk up to this extremely expensive equipment, because a lot of things can go wrong with something like this, right? Like, if you get an air bubble in the line that's setting up your sample, or, you know, things along those lines, you could really put, put a piece of equipment out of commission. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you're... So that's also another reason why it might be challenging for, you know, if you would want someone that like knows the machine really well to be able to maintain it. That's all I'm saying. That's how, important. How heavily would it be frowned upon to ask a friend that you know who works in a lab who has an aspect to, like, could you run this for me? And <laughs> I mean, it's you pretty much have to be dating the person, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you'd have to give your sample to someone that's dating the person. <laughs> um, I mean. I mean, there's both you, dating for scientists websites, and then there's also, uh, <laughs> no, no, that's a thing, that's a thing, <laughs> Google, um, then there's also the Science Direct, or like, uh, Science Exchange, yeah, there you go, yeah. they might ask yeah, sure. yeah, but yeah. then you'd pay, you know, yeah. so you could, I'm just was thinking of like lines, leveraging our, our local yeah. community here, there's plenty of people working in labs, yeah, right? if someone's doing a run and running many samples, and you're like slipping one in, that's mm -hmm. what you're asking, all right, mm -hmm. I think what's, what's difficult about... <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but we know other people that are working lots too. What's difficult <laughs> about that is that depending upon which compound of interest it is, the, the, the procedures for doing that separation are Absolutely. very different. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't necessarily know whether or not you're separating things away from their impurities. 
So it is. It, it's it's not it's not exactly easy. But yeah. now at the same time, the separation yeah. happens in there. the um, in the uh, the column, not necessarily in the mass spec. The mass, I mean, the mass spec is the expensive instrument compared right. to the column, correct? Yeah, sure. But like, it, depending on the so, for instance, like if I'm working with a compound that's really hydrophilic. And like you need me to analyze a compound that's really hydrophobic, mm -hmm. the mobile phase or like the program or the you know the the ratio of putting the hydrophilic phase versus the hydrophobic <laughs> phase through or the ratios at which you do that are going to be different. Um, so so that's one of the things that Matt's alluding to is that yeah, you know that's, that's I, I would have prep, yeah man. it's a prep yeah okay. it's like changing a protocol and tweaking a protocol for a different compound mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's one of the reasons why I, I try to encourage people away from doing metabolic engineering for compounds that are hard to detect mm -hmm. in other ways. Yeah. I mean, something that is going to give you a smell if it works, that, that's great. Yeah. Uh, something where you're trying to make some kind of precursor for a biofuel that you can't really measure any other way. Right. It's yeah. going to be a hard Absolutely. project. Yeah. Banana. Banana. You can do banana. <laughs> yeah, um, or you could just start another project and build your own sensor to detect your small molecule, which is, yeah. which is you know something to consider as well. Like that, you know, but that it has its own challenges for sure. And, um, and I think sort of projects that focus more on building logic in, into with synthetic biology, I mm -hmm. think that's more DIYable than some of the very sophisticated metabolic engineering that. There's already millions being poured into. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. So, you know, thinking about doing something like this could be a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to leave you with that. Um, what Patrick was mentioning before is if you can't detect geraniol, you know, there are things that you can tweak in the system, and that's what I spend, you know, almost every day doing is tweaking my construction such that I get the right expression that I need for whatever I'm doing. It doesn't have to be for a small molecule. Would you check for, like, mRNA expression from, from that the That would be example? ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be the ideal scenario is you're checking to make sure that um, MR, that you have RNA coming off of your promoter, which is important because if you're not, then that means protein is never going to get made, right? Yeah. So um, that the ideal scenario is you're kind of like checking each step of the way. One, something that I do, um, that if, or a few of us in the lab do actually, is we make, we make chimeras, so like, to check for expression, so for instance, mm -hmm. I have... Half lion, half eagle? Yes. Oh. <laughs> That's exactly what I was talking about. Um, or half rose and half GFP. Half, that's exactly <laughs> what I was talking about. Okay, so half rose and half GFP, that RBS is not drawn to scale, I apologize. But anyway, so you have an RBS here. And then um, if I have my geranial synthase gene here, I fuse it to, so I, I do not have a stop codon here, and I just have my start here, no stop codon, no start codon fused to GFP, and then final stop here such that if I get expression off of my promoter and it reads all the way through and I get a functional fluorescent output, then I at least know that my mRNA is being made and my, mm. you know. Um, is, is that better than just making like an operon with the GFP as a second gene? Well, you could get leaky expression off of GFP separately and you'll mm -hmm. never really, right. you mean if it had its own start? You might never really know. But the fusion protein might. Sure, there's always a chance that it, that is that is true. You you might get like dimmed fluorescence or, um, you know, because because you know it's attached to your other protein. Right. Like you put a linker here, a flexible linker in between the two, such that they should be able to fold independently of each other. So that's more but reliable than doing the fusion protein. Well, no, like that. It's it's more high through. Like it's yeah, it gives you an answer. This approach to purify the protein and actually see if those proteins functional. Oh sure. Yeah. So yeah. it's another step in the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, in so, you know you can always put like you mentioned you can always put a tag on your protein that's like a his tag or a or like GFP. Or a GFP you can pull down. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so this to me is like it's it's easier because then I can just drop my gene into a vector that has GFP in it and then I can like quickly screen for what's expressing and what's mm -hmm. not. You know. Um, as opposed to doing some sort of like mRNA level thing, which requires you requires you to have an RNA free conditions, and right. I mean mRNA is kind of challenging to work with. So, would but, you sorry. at some point, uh, if that works, go back and take the GFP off? Yeah, exactly. You can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 
I mean, just an example, like simultaneously, sometimes I'll co-build my constructs with the GFP fusion and not, you know, or, you know, you can somehow make this easily removable, whether that's through restriction enzymes or you can like PCR up your vector without the GFP. And I mean, there are, there are many ways to get rid of the of this portion here. Um, so. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about building blocks? So you don't necessarily have to synthesize that entire construct of your target gene plus the GFP. Correct. You might already have the, the GFP that you can put together, just put together yeah. with your I mean, gene of interest. Typically, uh, typically what I do is um, engineer my vet because I use so many different vectors, like, and they're not cross standardized really. Um, meaning that, meaning that I can't easily, like, cut this out from one place and drop it into another um, because the sites that I need are pre are not present on both vectors or something along those lines. But there, but. Um, there are ways to get around that. So, like, some vectors are standardized, and and they're called this, they're called bagel bricks or bio bricks, and they're standardized such that um, there are restriction enzyme sites present, so that you can actually like piece pieces of DNA together. I think like Genomicon also. I, I haven't looked into their kit too much, but Genomicon also has like they've engineered overhang such that you can like click pieces of DNA together in sequence. Um, and there are things called, another example of that would be um, golden braid assembly, which is something to look into where golden braid assembly is using these type 2 restriction enzymes that we talked about previously. But you can build a transcri transcriptional unit, meaning you can have promoter RBS gene terminator, and then you can add those together, those units together using restriction enzymes. So like you can independently build like this unit and then, like, if you want to express a series of genes, you can actually like build them together um, using type two restriction. I, I mean, these are very these are detailed. We can. De I mean, each one of these deserves its own um, course, which is something to think about. But um, so, if you want to look into like bricking pieces of DNA together like that, I would look up Bengal bricks. Um, golden Braid Fire and bricks. Golden Gate. Golden mm -hmm. Gate, actually, I look up um, Bio Bricks. And so for the the iGem competition, does anybody here not know what iGem is? So iGem is the engine. Let's see, International, International Genetically yeah. Engineered Machinery Competition. Yeah. Right. So it's a big uh, yearly competition, typically for uh, undergraduate teams, uh, to do s cool synthetic biology projects. Essentially, this is now like a worldwide phenomenon, and it's. Uh, it's essentially been the training ground for the current generation of synthetic biology. Um, and this is going to be the coming summer, is going to be the first year that they're allowing uh, DIY bio uh, teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and iGEM is uh, heavily linked to this BioBricks format for uh, putting these genetic pieces together essentially. They've already built up a large library of pieces from previous year's competitions uh, and at the start of the competition when you register they actually send you I think it's like three plates now of 396 well not 390 84, 84 yeah. Yeah. well plates uh, and those are all individual each of these wells has uh, one of those things that you normally would have to send out to have to have synthesized for you so you already get a, a massive amount of genetic material that you can put together in various yeah, ways. Yeah, exactly. So like, uh, they'll have the promoters kept separately right. and the you know genes that you need and terminators. Mm -hmm. and it's designed with restriction sites just that you can kind of like piece on one component yeah. after the other, I'm sorry. And we <coughs> totally want to do that this year. Yes. So if you're interested, stay tuned because we'll, we'll definitely be needing yeah. teammates to, to, mm -hmm. to help play with that over the summer. And funding. It, yeah. Yeah. And, and if you just want to help, yeah, fund us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the timeline for iGen? Like, when does it start? And how uh, <coughs> I think the team applications are due in like April or something. Uh, so it's typically a summer project for, yeah. for student teams. Um, there may very well be uh, like company sponsored teams. Uh, 
So I know Mac was, was trying to talk some companies into sponsoring teams. And so Google throws their weight at behind a team. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> here, we'll give you a million dollars to participate in this competition. Uh. <laughs> it is something to think about the like team. There's no restriction on size of the team. But you do have to pay registration per yes. each team member, and then also if you get accepted to World, the World Jamboree or whatever, it's you pay for everyone's flight as well. Um, so it is nice to be that it would be nice to be this all-encompassing, open to everyone thing. But mm -hmm. then we should also think about um, realistically, financially, like how many people are feasible mm -hmm. to yeah. you know have a team. That will act, that could actually make it to the final competition, right? Because that would be awesome. Yeah. Even most of the the student teams look for financial sponsorship. They mm -hmm. sort of it's kind of like when you're doing a bake sale, you go ring at a lot of doors. And <laughs> 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 Except here, you're ringing at doors of companies that make DNA and stuff like yeah, that. Right? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it was like three thousand or something for the team plus. So it's like eight. A couple of hundred per person. But yeah, I think it's like 400 or 500 for, yeah. for registration. And it's like you pay to get the parts, you pay like the DNA mm -hmm. parts from the registry and then you have, there's a registration fee per person and there's like whatever flight cost would be per person. Right. Yeah. So it ends up being, and then research costs, is probably like a five to $10,000 investment. Mm -hmm. And then you ideally want to do something that continues post the iGEM competition. Like if you're going to put that much into something, you'd want to potentially pick a project that you know, can go beyond just, mm -hmm. it's not just a competition project, but something that could be developed into something. Yeah. And, and for that, the DIY buy teams actually have an edge because if you're doing a student team with a bunch of undergrad, undergraduates, they're going to graduate and they're going to disperse all across the globe and yeah. that project may never be continued ever again, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or some graduate student, don't get, it'll get shoved off onto some graduate yeah. student, maybe. <laughs> Um, yeah, Kim, I'm sorry. Um, I just had a question, like, from your objective, if you could just, like, bullet point it, like, basically your objective is you want to take this genetic sequence where, you know, you replicate this thing that you find. So you get this synthase from, like, where mint or basil, right? Mm -hmm. And then could you, like, kind of just bullet point it just briefly up until the point where it gets to the plasmid? Yeah, sure. Insert it. If you could just kind of, what we all covered and just kind of bullet point Somewhere. this sequentially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a bit of a neophyte here, so mm -hmm. please excuse me. No, that's good. It's important. Um, so, <coughs> okay, I guess we should just start. Okay, so we decided we wanted to make this the rose scent pathway. So step one after that would be would be look up the biosynthetic pathway. So look into that. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was important. And then we, we determine which precursor is present in the organism you want to go into. So what precursor is present in the host organism, right? And then once we determine... And, and there, sometimes you can say, okay, this, this stuff isn't present in E. coli, but it is present in yeast. Let's right. do yeast instead. Exactly. Right? You might pivot your organism depending. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, you know, in our case, we found out that the precursor is present in, in E. coli. So we can say, we go to, so what gene, what gene do we need to make that conversion from the precursor to the final, the final? Um, and we determined that that gene is present in various plant organisms, right? So we have to either get our hands on the seed DNA from the plant and, and PCR the gene, or we can just synthesize the DNA, synthesize the gene, right? Now in your example, we just went with synthesis, but are there any scenarios where seed DNA is an easier, better way to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, if you know, yeah, it is. I mean, it'll be faster, less expensive. Um, the, the only challenge with this is that you can't customize what restriction sites are present in the gene, right? So, like, you would go back to the natural sequence, and then you would just have to engineer, make sure your vector's engineered such that there are restriction sites that you can clone into that aren't present in here, right? Yeah. At, at least in the, when you get your gene synthesized, you can get rid of restriction sites and things without changing the amino acid sequence. But if you're going right off of the genome, then you have no, you don't code on, there's no code on optimization. There's no getting rid of restriction sites, right? You're just like pulling something right off of the genome and you're not, you don't get to like 
customize it at all. Yeah. Um, but, but I think five to ten years from now, nobody's going to go get genes out of an organism. Exactly. Anymore. It will be yeah. all synthesis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you can domesticate out the restriction sites. That still might be faster and cheaper. You mean do it yourself, like yeah. with cloning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what you're, what, what Jamie out. mentioned is you could use primers, is that what you mean? To mutate out the restriction site. So like you can site direct, you can site change nucleotides using, um, using cloning or using PCR. You, yeah, and we can get into that. But yes, and but that would be another step of, if you, the, getting it synthesized, it would be the best way to go. Yeah. You know, and then it's more thinking time you can put into other things while you're waiting for your gene to come. But, but then five <laughs> ten years from now, people are going to ask, should we start with like a natural E. coli or should we just synthesize it from scratch? The organism? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that is probably going to happen as well. Okay, so we went from bison pathway, is precursor present? How do we get from the precursor to the final? We found those genes. We're going to get them synthesized. We're going to take our synthesized piece of DNA and we are going to clone into a vector. And this is obviously assuming that we've worked out our cloning strategy. So this, this, this should be a really awesome meetup, just filling in this gap, probably, if like, we actually want to move forward with this project or a project similar to this. Um, um, so we clone it into a vector, and then we, we transform our vector, meaning we put our DNA hopefully carrying our gene into, into E. coli. And we, then we want to isolate, isolate the positive clone, meaning we want to isolate the clone that actually had the gene in the vector. So we isolate that and we sequence it, check. And then we, we take our clone and we retransform retransform into expression cells. So that could be the same strain that you cloned <clears throat> that you cloned in, but you, you want to transform into your final host, whatever that is. There are many strains of E. coli, so maybe you're picking a different strain for another purpose, but you know, you are retransforming into your So expression. what's what's the reason I'm doing transformation twice? Um you don't have to. <coughs> it, it, you don't have to. It just depends. It depends okay. What Patrick is saying is like if you simultaneously identified your positive clone from a colony and also inoculated a culture from that colony then hopefully that culture will smell like roses and you're done right like um in my i'll give an example per, an example from what i'm working on now the strain that i'm cloning in isn't the strain i'm expressing in because the strain that i the the promoter system i'm using requires proteins that are in a different strain of e coli and a more uh, finicky growth strain and a more expensive strain of E. coli. So um, instead, I'm cloning into a boring E. coli strain, and then I'm retransforming my vector into the expression strain that has like the right polymerases and things that right. I need. Um, so you, so it just kind so you of work out the bugs and the exactly the work easy out the bugs strain. and the easy strain, right. and then I save my expression right. strain that needs certain conditions and. Um, has some like toxic growth properties and other finicky things for mm -hmm. actual expression, not for cloning. Cloning well, plants a good example too, where you, you clone in E. coli, but we have to get into agrobacterium. Mm -hmm. Right. Plant transformation. So. Exactly. So whatever. So if you don't need to retransform, then you don't have to. If you want to put right. your your positive clone DNA clone into a new vector, that, I mean into a new strain, then um, then you'd want to save right. your mini prep DNA and put it into a new host. Also, if you're putting a lot of pieces together, like you might want to send something in the environment and have some logic to figure out what to do, and then have some reporter genes, you may want to try all of those separately and then Put transform them together. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so maybe you're retransforming, maybe you're not, depending on your scenario. I'll put a question mark. And then, okay. So this is kind of, this is. A, this is a very basic overview, I guess. Um, but I don't know if that helps with driving the points home at all. Um, so, kind of to be clear, going way back to the beginning of, of this, are we trying to get 
a more tasty smelling lab strain of E. coli, or are we trying to generate geraniol? That's an excellent, mm -hmm. that's right. an excellent question. Well, it depends. <coughs> so maybe for me, it's to have, my, it's to make sure the lab smells nicely on a daily basis. Um, but maybe for someone else, it's to actually make geraniol. So that is an excellent point. If you are going to biosynthesize something and you're not doing it just for fun, but you're doing it because you want to potentially make some money off of it, then it's important to understand the market and understand the necessity for that small molecule. Like, would it be less expensive to have it biosynthesized versus its current method of synthesis? Um, is there a need for it? Like, what would be, what would having an abundance of geraniol do for the population? Like, you know, I know some people use it as bug repellents. Um, you know, it's, it might be a common compound in some fragrances or things some along those lines. Some people are sensitive to it. Some people are sensitive to it. Um, it I'm sorry, in what way? Uh, like, can that in large enough concentrations, uh, it, it it can be an irritant. It can be irritant. Okay, so you know, like. Maybe rose scent wouldn't be the best thing to go after economically, right? Um, but if you're, yeah, so if you're, if you're trying to think of things to like start your own project or your own company or something that has like market value, then, you know, you would want to put time into like, what is the, why would I want to biosynthesize this? Is it even important to, do we need more of it? Is it extremely expensive to the consumer to purchase? Would making it this way drive down the cost and make it more accessible? Like there are all these things to consider when, when doing a metabolic engineering project. You don't necessarily want to waste your time going after something that isn't important unless you just want to like, to me, this is this would be a fun thing to do, and who knows, something cool coming. You could have a little bioreactor in your backyard at your picnic, like so bugs aren't <laughs> bugs aren't <laughs> aren't flying around your food or something. I don't know. You could think of interesting like ways to. So, so, do so that. The, the other side of the coin of that is is that if you're synthesizing, for example, biofuels, right? It's not just enough to be able to smell the biofuel or be show that it, that it's there. But you need to be able to produce those biofuels at dollars per gallon, right? So you have to make sure that 90 or more percent of, of the initial uh, sugar that you put into the culture is actually converted to the biofuel, otherwise it's not going to be worth it. Yeah. And you have to make sure all the, all the waste is taken care of and figure out how to recycle everything. And so. Making and biofuels to, is and it has really to be cheaper easy. than the sugar itself. So yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> so so yeah. making biofuels is really really easy. Making biofuels economically is not very, very hard. easy at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So those are all very. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that well, up. Yeah. The, the only reason I brought it up is we're, you know, you're talking about transforming and retransforming yeah. E. coli. You might have an E. coli that would be really easy to read from to get it into that would be really easy to pull uh, positive clones out of. And then retransforming it into your your laboratory strain, the strain that you use sure, or whatever yeah. you're interested in. That justifies sort of the last two yeah. steps. In it. And you probably at that point want to move from a vector to the genome. Right. Um, to make it, you know, because if you're, the plasmid will get lost over time and it's going to mutate and things like that. But if you find like, if your promoter RBS gene element works well in a vector, then you might want to consider just putting that into your host strain genome, which is a whole other procedure, um, such that it's like forever in the genome of the strain that you're working in. Um, what did you say? Sorry, I missed it. Oh, the, the um, justifying the point of why you would would retransform. So like you, so you like I might use ten different types of strains of E. coli. So I would want to take my positive clone and put them into all the strains, such that they all smell like roses um, and then I was saying as an extension of that I was saying at that point you probably want to move from the vector to the genome um, such that it's stable in your host genome and not on a vector that <clears throat> can be lost either due to dilution effects or mutagenesis or things along those lines um, but then you can no longer sort of rely on having a high copy number that is correct then you'd have to alter the yes yeah. then you're then you know the benefit of being on a vector is that you're making many many copies of your vector so once you're in the genome then you might have to like kick up the promoter or change the rbs or something such that you're getting more expression if need be you might find that low copy is enough who knows sometimes overexpressing the protein is not good and you want to drop it and that could be this scenario as well but yes there are like in a, there are it, so many iterations of cloning and things to do, you know, in order to make a system work. So now you can see, like, this was, uh, in theory, a simple 
you know, simple project <coughs> moving one gene from an organism to another. But now as like, you know, you were bringing up all these potential failure points, you can imagine like what's happening if you are trying to like metabolic engineer a 10 step pathway or things along those lines. Like that's why it is so challenging and there's so many points of failure, you know, like you, you would think maybe in your mind you have three genes in a pathway, you just want like promoter gene, promoter gene, promoter gene. and and. And that was that's being shown sometimes not to be the best case. Maybe you want like a promoter driving a gene in the reverse direction, and maybe you know it's just like all this crazy stuff that you you wouldn't necessarily think of when you're first starting this process. But that's why I think you know it's like if you move start with a system like this where it's just one gene, whether it's row stem or something else along those lines, you get a good feel for the types of things and the types of things that go wrong and how you characterize, and then you can just expand to you know bigger bigger things. But yeah, I don't know. So, so I don't. I don't know if that helped at all with, <laughs> with wanting like an overview of what we talked about. But um, there's, there's ever, definitely a lot of information. <laughs> are you ever afraid of GMOs? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. No. Why is that? Um, <laughs> Couldn't you equivocate more? <laughs> <laughs> um. Well. Okay, I mean, this is like... there might be some people in this room who hear that I can transform all yeah. of these things and they think, oh, it's easy to do things and, 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 and something I do, I might make a lab mistake and, mm -hmm. and suddenly kill us all. Yeah. You don't know what the consequences <laughs> are going to be. So, like, if you're moving something from one organism to another and these are, like, natural existing systems that aren't, you know, like, you know what you're working with, okay. Let's start with this. If you know what you're working with from ahead of time, you're not working with something, a gene that's, I, was, I would hope that if you're working with a gene that creates like some sort of human toxin or something along those lines, like you would alert those around you or things like that. Um, but, you know, something like this where I'm just like making something smell like roses, I'm taking a natural pathway that's like a non-pathogenic or not toxic pathway and I'm, and I'm putting it in a system that's very well characterized and also, you know, of the same and um, to me, that's no different than if I were to just like, yeah. you know, have a plate of E. coli next to my face and a mom sniffing a rose or something like that, right? You, you, you or, can or, bake bread with rose petals in it. Yeah, exactly. Into the yeast. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it doesn't, you know, taking those types of pathways and mixing them together, it, I have doesn't concern me whatsoever. Um, and the same thing with like removing a gene from a system to extend its to just end like shelf life of a of a of a plant or fruit or something, whatever, whatever it is, um, vegetable or fruit, like that doesn't, I mean, I think there are these, you know, if you're going to make your strawberries taste like garlic, then what's the difference between just eating a piece of garlic and a strawberry at the same time or something along those lines? Like, you know, there's this misconception there. Yeah. yeah um, are there any hot topics in this field? Because um, I, I always meet this person from TEPCO. And From where? Uh, Tepco, and if you're, you're familiar familiar with it, it's the company that's working on um, the Fukushima oil spill mm -hmm. and, and finding algae or some resource to break down mm. the chemical spills. Yeah. And I was just wondering, are, are there areas in the field now that are really hot that people are going um, kind of like in high drive to to really research? No, biofuels so. is no longer a hot topic right now. <laughs> Not um, since fracking really year. lowered the price for fuels all around the world. That's kind of hard for me to answer, actually. I mean, I Antibiotic see... Antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic, that's huge. Yeah, that's, that's not necessarily, like, okay. in synthetic biology so much. Yeah. Um, Bio, bioremediation. Bioremediation. Yeah. Having, having, like, uh, like some plants have uh, an enzyme that'll bind to arsenic or that'll bind mm -hmm. to cadmium. For instance, uh, we ship all the electronics when these are done, we ship them uh, to India and to China, and it ends up in big waste pits and it pollutes everything. It's really nasty stuff. If you could generate uh, 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 bacteria that went through and picked up the cadmium and locked it in um, their cell structure and mm -hmm. then sank to the bottom, mm -hmm. and you could scrape it off and put it in barrels, basically, like you put it toxic material in barrels. That's, yeah. that's a general way. It, it's a complicated yeah. issue. It's not like getting... Same thing with arsenic or mercury. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so th there are uh, plants that, that do these things, and so it's mm -hmm. getting the plant one in, into there. But it's not like getting a rose scent where we had almost all of the pathway 
and we just had to add the one little gene to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a serious problem of trying to get a, a lot of uh, inner working pieces to work together and play nicely with mm -hmm. each other. And that, that's a big challenge. You know. Camellias actually do that. I mean, camellias including tea. Uh, the, they, they do accumulate heavy metals. So mm -hmm. that uh, the the rose family, the family that makes the you know green and black tea, will bioaccumulate heavy metals if, mm -hmm. if exposed to them. So mm -hmm. so there there definitely are opportunities to uh, combine a rose growing um, uh, passion with uh, molecular <laughs> biology <laughs> passion to cure the world of uh, heavy metals. So. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily in like the hottest area. In no, no, no. I'm trying, I mean, like people it, are really it, still stuck I mean, on. The whole field is so hot; it's kind of hard yeah. to point out one particular area. But I see like different things. A lot of people. I mean, obviously, there's a lot after the small molecule production, like finding the right things mm -hmm. to make. You know, like what small molecules are important to make, like whether it's fragrances or flavors or mm -hmm. um, antibiotics, maybe and about, you know, anti malarial. Yeah, yeah like artemisinin, yeah. yeah. which is like the you know, ongoing mm -hmm. poster child for the, for the field and, you know, things along those lines. But like, there are far similar, simpler uh, molecules in artemisinin that could be made. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> plastics. Yeah. And, I mean, there, there are some. So, so there was a, a what, Indiegogo campaign, I think, for making a, um, a yogurt that produces resveratrol, which is the, the healthy component of red wine. Uh -huh. um, so that, and that would only need like three or four genes essentially. So they were going to put it in lactobacillus, uh, and but once once you get into areas where Healthy, you might yeah, probably like be something to the nutraceuticals is kind of right. like the hot, yeah. you know, that's a hot word. But releasing some kind of genetic engineered organism to the public is still a very hot topic as the glowing plant people. Yeah. Very well now. <laughs> yeah. The other the, so like back to the ethics thing. Like that's still a huge like oh, every synthetic biology conference there's. At least a day dedicated mm -hmm. to yeah. you know ethics conversations, and, and, and every single iGEM team is supposed to sort of cover those topics. Yeah, and, like mm -hmm. like yeah. safe. They call it safe or human practices, I guess. Yeah. Like um, LC. Yeah. Medical, legal societal issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that it's interesting to be in a field that um, is being so heavily watched right now, because mm -hmm. nobody really under like as researchers, I don't think there's a well a good understanding of the potential yet mm -hmm. and um and then of course it's very hand wavy because w when you start off saying we can do anything we can engineer anything we can make anything um <laughs> you know like that's it's just, exciting <laughs> to us but it's yeah. for a lot of people. yeah exactly so it you know so but then but the reality is like okay so maybe that's not 100 percent true but then it's kind of finding like well what does that mean and what can you make and how do you regulate it and i think even iGEM's under this heavy watch because like people are sending dna everywhere now that like iGEM's grown you know dna components are just being like sent all over the world and you know so it's like what does it mean for for that right so like uh, th there are a ton of concerns. There are some ir there are rational concerns that something <coughs> awful will be made, as Matt alludes. Like someone's going to make the the worst form of the flu virus, or the you know what I mean. But it's it's really hard. Cool. I mean, like and, and for someone to be able to do that, <laughs> yeah. reproduce stars. Yeah, yeah. For like someone, like someone to be yeah. able to do that in the settings that yeah. I mean, we we know so little we about know viruses so, yeah, that we exactly. it's, it's not really possible to engineer a good one. So I, those things really Nature don't concern much me so much. Do you yeah. know of anyone who's been harmed by this kind of thing? No. Well, other than being locked up for <laughs> having been accused of doing it. But. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, I've worked in, I mean, I've worked in virus labs. So to me, that's much more dangerous than anything I'd ever be yeah, doing in yeah, synthetic yeah, biology. Yeah. So. I mean, there's, there's people killing, uh, people uh, uh, dying from, from allergies, food allergies across the world, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, when you eat sort of a new exotic fruit for the very first time that you've never had before, you don't know if you're gonna have an allergic, allergic reaction. So a new GMO, we have much more certainty about how it's going to behave mm -hmm. than any new exotic fruit that comes on the market. Absolutely. What about brand new technologies 